topic today, ASEAN and the New World Disorder, Thailand seeking a new balance. I think it's clear amid uh, growing US-China tensions that huge and fundamental changes are afoot, not just in the world, but particularly in this region, particularly for smaller countries, which are feeling increasingly squeezed amid big power rivalry um, against this backdrop. Some countries like Thailand and I think Singapore have assiduously navigated a path, um, striving to achieve the best of, of both worlds uh, between the US-led, uh, US and Japan-led uh, um, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and uh, China's BRI and uh, expanding um, uh, economic diplomacy. Uh, and in recent times, I think Thailand has clearly had its own challenges. Uh, disruptive politics and a royal succession amongst them. Uh, these three panellists between them bring both broad and very deep perspectives on the various facets of this new order or disorder as we're calling it, uh, including ASEAN's position in, in the broader world and uh, external as well as internal views of Thailand's role in it, uh, particularly in the regional context. So without uh, Further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Professor Kwa to kick the discussion off, and we'll have time at the end for question and answer, um, about half an hour, so please save up your um, uh, searing uh, questions for the panelists. So over to you. Thank, thank you, Gwen. And thank you all this morning for sharing your time with us. As Gwen has said, my name is Danny Kwa. I'm Dean at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. This event that you know, ISIS had jointly organized with us uh, is one in our Asia Thinker series, where what we've tried to do is distill some of the argument and debate and ideas that we are working on at the Lee Kuan Yew School and recognize and acknowledge that we need more local understanding. Part of our goal is to help improve the state of governance and economic performance, state of economic well-being across Asia. That's always been part of our mission as a part of the National University of Singapore. And the only way we can do that is by going out and understanding Asia better. Not just from reading journals, but actually going out and having conversations like this one. I also want to have a special shout out to the Lee Kuan Yew School students who are either alumni or coming up to us. Uh, uh, the relation between the Lee Kuan Yew School and Thailand has been a long and fruitful one. Over the last 15 years, we have enrolled 50, close to 50 students who are now numbered among our alumni. In our executive education training, we have engaged with more than 250. Uh, this year alone, we've got another five new Thai students coming to us. So that relationship is one that we want to continue. I come here as an economist wanting to engage in conversation about what's happening to our state, to the state of ASEAN, and how it engages with the rest of the world. And I come here to want to try and understand better from conversation with my fellow panelists and with you, what exactly Thailand might be able to sit, how exactly Thailand might be able to situate itself, what are the different pull and pull, push and pull parameters, what are the different considerations. Because it seems to me for Thailand, for Singapore, for all of us across ASEAN, our fundamental priorities have got to remain peace and prosperity. That is the ultimate goal. We are a collection with a total GDP of close to 3 trillion US dollars now, 600 million people continuing to grow at one of the fastest rates in the world. The world's economic center of gravity is rapidly converging towards us here in ASEAN. Looking forwards, what do we do with that? Because we in ASEAN have had a good run we have had a good three, four decades of fine, robust economic growth. Okay. 
that has been a challenge that we have been able to deal with. We have been able to leverage increasingly open markets elsewhere in the world. We have been able to conduct our business with the rest of the world under a well understood set of rules, a rules based order that has brought to us globalization, a robust trading system, a way in which to conduct business in the world, the spread of ideas and economic prosperity. And although it is implicit, it is in the back of our mind, it's not something as obviously palpable as opening up a special economic zone, say, that then allows greater trade between people on the ground here in Thailand with people elsewhere. It is that background that has brought untold prosperity, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of dire poverty across Asia. And when Gwen and the rest of us say new world disorder, it is because we are worried that that rules-based order is potentially at risk. There are many symptoms of that. The most visible of those that we read about every day is the US-China trade war. We all know that at the end of last year, America raised tariffs against Chinese imports. Earlier this year, just last month, those tariffs have been increased with the threat that more will be coming. This is a huge disruption in world order. There are reasons behind it that we, need, we would like to understand so that we can take ASEAN, Thailand, Singapore, and conduct ourselves in the right way in this emerging new international system. Okay. And when I gave that recitation of dry fact about world disorder and the US-China trade war, there's a background, of course, that we need to unpack. And it's understanding that background, in my view, that will lead us to a slicker, smoother, deft understanding of where ASEAN might place itself. That background of US trade tariffs against China comes from an acknowledgement by many observers of a varying scale of what in their eyes is Chinese misbehavior. That misbehavior in many people's interpretations came out of an initial undervaluation and manipulation of the Chinese RMB, continuing state subsidy to state-owned enterprises that in some people's analysis would not be viable except for this interference with the workings of the marketplace. It comes from a refusal of China to acknowledge that knowledge is property and so to respect intellectual property rights. It comes from the idea that China has broken the rules of the world trading order. And that that breaking of the rules needs to be called out. But more than just breaking the rules, there's also the notion that China bends the rules. That in our dealings with China, that nation has continued to militarize features in the South China Sea, is using its economic prowess to intimidate and bully others. It is in a full-throated, no holds barred competition to dominate the industries and technologies of the future. And the coming together of this open season on the world's largest trading nation continues. It continues, it veers into politics. It is, in some people's interpretation, the US-China trade conflict is but a symptom of a deeper, simmering geopolitical tension. It is America calling out China for its significant departure from liberal ideology, from disrespect for human rights. It is America calling out China on China's undermining of the international order, even as it benefits from it. 
it is from is America calling out China for its being an authoritarian system to use language from the US national security strategy document seeking to undermine the liberal world order to make the world in its own image and to exercise increasing veto on the legitimate economic, diplomatic, and security choices made by others around it. That is a set of concerns that I have recited from one perspective, from an American perspective. There's pushback on this, of course, because China's own narrative is one that it is seeking continuing development for its own people. It's misinterpreted in terms of its control of technology. Its previous respect for how the West conducted its business is now undermined by what it sees in terms of increasing inequality, political fracture, an invective of hate based on racial and religious considerations that it now sees emerging from the West. If ever there was the idea that as China liberalized, it would politically converge towards the West, that was at risk even before these rounds of US-China trade conflict. Both sides are now engaged in this confrontation that if we don't watch out, Will, see, will lead to a demonization of the other side with a denial that the other side too has legitimate national goals and ambitions. The world, the new world disorder that, that Gwen has referred to is in a dangerous place. Let me conclude by suggesting what ASEAN can do. Because the story that I've just told is a story of great power competition. It's a story of both sides calling out the other as its geostrategic competitor. It's a no holds barred competition that if we continue down that path, it's not going to end well. ASEAN, for the time being, sits outside of that. Of course, we look on the great trade conflict with concern. What I described to you as the pathway that we have taken to economic prosperity is now undermined. If the global trading order no longer is in place, what do we do with continuing our manufacturing progress, with continuing industrialization, with continuing the learning by doing, the economies of scale, the increasing returns that we all need to be able to leverage as our economies in ASEAN move from developing economies through middle income status to first world income status. Okay, let me conclude and then I will look forward to the subsequent discussion and to my fellow panelists giving their views on what Thailand might do. But here's my idea about ASEAN. ASEAN needs to view two possibilities. One is as an alternative architect to regional order. If the great powers are no longer minded to continue to build a rules-based order, we need to do that. We need to become alternative architects. The second is, we need to become articulate and empowered consumers of whatever world order is in offer provided to us by a supply side that comprises at least the United States and China. We need to be alternative architects. We need to be empowered consumers. We need to take leadership on those transboundary problems, haze, sustainability, that concern our region, that is now not part of the focus of this growing geopolitical conflict. There's a lot of room for ASEAN, Thailand, Singapore to move forward, to maneuver in making order out of this disorder. But now is the time for us to do it. Now is the time for us to come together, speak in a unified voice, because it is only by doing so that our collection of economies has a footprint 
that's large enough to move the needle on world order. Whether we see for ourselves a future as alternative architects or as empowered consumers. That, it seems to me from where I stand, is the way ahead. And I'm here to have that conversation with you on what you think the steps we might take here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Danny, for that. Uh, certainly setting a uh, sort of slightly dark and dystopian view of the future, but not without hope, as you say. And uh, I think um, this turns the focus on, uh, as you say, ASEAN, uh, the uh, prospects for better collective uh, um, action and uh, thinking, and that uh, brings us to Dr. Titinan, who I think has an extremely uh, unique and incisive view of events in this country, and uh, we, as I said, have had a protracted election and royal succession, and we, say, we are seeing something like a new but messy and highly fragile order taking place. Uh, which many predict will be short-lived. But uh, this is Thailand's big year as chair of ASEAN as well. And uh, how do you think, uh, how do you see things? Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Gwent. Um, and good morning, everyone. First, I want to just say that uh, uh, it's an honor to have uh, Danny Kwa on our stage uh, today, this morning. Thank you for approaching us to co-organize this with you. And Professor Kwa, you know, he talked a lot about the NUS and the Kuan Yew School. Uh, I always know him as a professor at the London School of Economics, where I attended, uh, and uh, for a very long time he was there. And having accomplished everything that you could do as an economist at LSE, uh, he then moved on to uh, other areas, uh, international studies and so on, and also has relocated to our neighborhood. So uh, very grateful that you're here. And uh, you know, on top of it all, he, he always has time for students and colleagues, and you know, this is his, his trademark uh, above and beyond being a great economist and scholar of the world. And uh, I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Somkiet. I think it's your first time speaking on our platform, maybe first time, second time. So thank you very much for, for coming here today. Um, look, I think Danny has uh, uh, broken a lot of ground uh, and set the scene. Uh, it's undeniable now. I mean, the word disorder uh, is part of the course, is an, you know, no longer contested. Uh, we have global disorder now. So let me just draw two parallels um, between, between the global and, and the local and Thailand. Um, you know, you mentioned ASEAN as a, uh, a place where we can pin our hopes for future order making. You know, the, uh, when it comes to world order, it's the order makers and their order takers. And you mentioned China as perhaps a, an order breaker and bender. Um, and, and you have a point, you have a point. Um, I would say that, you know, in the last, We've had a, not just an ASEAN good run, but a, a good long run for the liberal international order. From the 40s, mid 40s, you know, seven decades long. The same seven decades, Thailand had its own political order. You know, and it runs almost in exact parallel. Uh, when the international, the liberal international order uh, became more eroded, challenged, and kind of came loose at the seams. I think it hasn't quite collapsed, but certainly it's been uh, coming apart and been challenged. Um, in Thailand, similar. You know, in a way, you become a victim of your own success. Uh, in the international system, the liberal international order was so successful in fostering, forging um, economic development in many parts of the world, you know, uh, what used to be called the third world became the developing world, the emerging markets, and uh, nowhere, no neighborhood is more salient and uh, prominent than Southeast Asia. You know, so if you look back in ASEAN's timeline, in the 1960s, 1970s, it was a fragile, fragiling uh, kind of uh, hodgepodge of uh, mix, uh, you know, motley mix of different states trying to emerge from the colonial era, uh, trying to uh, uh, get through the Cold War. And uh, there's a little spot, just add a current anecdote, uh, what uh, Prime Minister Lee Sin Lung said about Vietnam and Cambodia. You know, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia, there's no doubt, uh, on December 25th, it was Christmas Day in 1978. And uh, it was a, 
uh, you know, to dislodge the Khmer Rouge, but uh, it was a thick of the Cold War, and Thailand really felt it. Um, so ASEAN has been a beneficiary of this long-standing um, liberal international order, and so has China. You know, all these countries have benefited from the liberal international order now, uh, from China, Indonesia, to Brazil, and uh, um, you, know, you name it, South Africa, and all the G, most of the G20 countries, in fact. Now they want to have more say, and I think China most of all. Um, so this challenges the, the existing the incumbent rules that have been established, and also the power um, polarities, the power positions of the different countries, um, the different major powers. You know, the European Union, you've got Germany and Japan here. You know, so there's a, there's a power asymmetries, uh, distortions now inherent in the system. After seven decades, uh, it needs to be revamped. You know, it needs to be revamped. And uh, revamping it, overhauling it wholesale means a, a reordering of uh, uh, power makers um, and uh, takers. Um, and we're not seeing that. So I think that the, the lack of uh, global adjustments to, to order making uh, ha have, uh, have manifested in these tensions between the US and China. So on the one track, we have a liberal international order that has eroded over time. It has become a victim of its own success. It promoted free trade, and it got a lot of free trade. A lot of countries became developed, uh, even Thailand, upper middle income. And global trade expanded uh, robustly until the last several years. Um, the international monetary system, more or less, uh, was pretty stable over that same period. Uh, but now, by that very own success, it has brought its own challenges. For Thailand, you can say something similar, which is that you know we had, um, if you can imagine, 1946, after the war. Uh, Thailand um, was the backwater country. I mean, it was not uh, even, uh, you know, around here was uh, rice paddies. There were buffaloes roaming the fields uh, in those days, right on this very premise. Um, so the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, period of nation building, order making. And during that time, there was a Cold War, there was communism. So Thailand, um, forged together with, uh, in the Cold War context, uh, a, a, in a political order of a kind, uh, centered on the monarchy, the military, and the bureaucracy. So if you come to Thailand in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, you, know, you will see political parties, future forward, from Jai Thai, you, know, you will see a lot of uh, military, uh, military dictatorship. We had a military dictatorship from 1947 to 1973. Right? And if you come here in the late 1970s, you had more military dictatorship of sorts. Uh, in the 1980s, you have a, a kind of a semi-military uh, authoritarian rule uh, in a kind of a compromise. So Thailand, uh, during the same period, ha had established a, a certain kind of political order. And it also became a victim of its own success. Uh, that order was so successful in two things. One, um, fighting communism. I, I call it a kind of a Cold War fighting machine, uh, comprising the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy. Uh, in the 1960s, 70s, communist expansionism was virulent. Uh, it was a, a real existential danger. And you know, when, when Vietnamese tanks took over Cambodia in two weeks, um, by early January, I remember a photo on Thai Rat newspaper, the Mass Daily here, front page photo, a Vietnamese tank right on the Thai border. So that was very real, communist expansionism. Um, but uh, you know, Thailand got through that. That's the first major achievement that we will, should never forget of that established order. Second, you know, in this neighborhood where Burma became autarkic, Indochina became communist, and with all the turmoil that came with it, Thailand was relatively stable. You know, uh, it didn't become communist, and it also had a uh, environment that enabled economic development. So in the 1970s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, from 60 to 97, the Thai economy expanded 6% a year, real terms, right? That's phenomenal, you know, that's phenomenal on a scale comparable to Chinese 
growth event uh, in a different uh, on 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 a on a logic and analogy. Um, you know, so these two major achievements became kind of a, they brought their own challenges. More people had income, education, exposure to the outside world, and so they wanted voice representation. So this became the undercurrents, uh, pressuring for uh, a more open space, so more elections, more political parties, uh, not so much the closed space of military authority and rule from 1947 to 1973. So military dictatorship uh, became untenable. You had to have elections at the end of the day. Uh, so by the 1990s, late 90s, after trials and tribulations, Thailand came up with a very reform-driven, kind of a uh, almost holy grail of, of constitutions in Thailand. Thailand's had a lot of constitutions, 20 uh, in 87 years. Um, and that 1997 constitution was supposed to deliver Thailand to the promised land of being a kind of a open democracy with uh, rights and freedoms uh, away, forever away from uh, military dictatorship. Um, but uh, in turn, um, it also brought its own challenges because when the space opened up, uh, because of this you know, pressure from below, um, the, the open space then became kind of dominated even monopolized by, by a political juggernaut at the time, uh, embodied in the former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat and his party machine, which is still um, dominant today. And they, they were the largest winning party in, in the last election on March 24th. Um, so this juggernaut then became a challenge to the established political order. Right? So if you think China is a challenge to the US-dominated international liberal international order, um, the new forces behind Thaksin, new business groups, um, alliance, coalition of uh, former left-wing left -wing students and academics and civil society and so on, with new business interests, with new capital. Um, they, and this new capital, by the way, was kind of stock market driven, internationally financed. Um, then they became the challenge to the status quo. Um, so when you have this chasm, this confrontation between the old and the new, something has to happen. So in the international system, it's happening. So we're seeing China challenging the US on a number of fronts, BRI, AIB, but, but I think the biggest challenge is that China is a, you know, it's a totalitarian state. The US calls this a whole of government approach. You know, Mike Pence calls it this, uh, uh, they use the entire government machinery and apparatus to achieve strategic objectives. But they are a totalitarian state, unlike the Soviet Union. They are a totalitarian state that has blended market capitalism and has conquered, mastered market capitalism. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's even a more formidable, formidable foe to the U.S. than the Soviet Union. You know, the Soviet Union and the U.S., they never they had confrontation, but ne they never fought directly. So the big difference, I don't see this as a Cold War between US and China, because the Cold War was always fought in third countries, somewhere else, never directly between the US and Soviet Union. But between China and the US, it's being fought directly between the two. Tariffs, I mean, technology, pushback, Huawei, you name it. And now it's spread spreading into culture, I mean, the, you know, Chinese government's warning citizens about gun violence in America, um, you know, the U.S. government thinking about maybe curtailing Chinese students in American universities, um, they, you know, talking about curbing Confucius Institutes, and so the, the front, the battlefront, is pretty much now kind of non-military. I think it runs the gamut. So, that is ongoing, and I think China uh, is having a little bit of an upper hand because of its pragmatism, it's adjustable, and in the long run, if Trump wins the second term and he presses even harder, I think it could boomerang. If Ch the US comes around and forces countries to choose between the US and China, some countries around here in Southeast Asia might choose initially um, the US, 
like Treaty Allies, for example, but they won't like it. And in medium, longer term, uh, it'll go against the U.S. Um, you know, the U.S. in the 1960s, 50s, right? They were challenged by the Soviet Union. In, in 19, mid 1950s, the Soviet Union was ahead of the U.S. Industrialized, they sent a vehicle to space before the U.S. The Sputnik moment, so-called. So the U.S. administration, the U.S. government, they responded by raising the game, raising their game. So they said, hey, we're going to send a man to the moon. Right? It was an inspirational approach. They inspired their people to achieve more, to surpass the adversary, to overcome the adversary. This U.S. government is not inspirational. It's resentful. So you know, instead of saying, hey, look, Silicon Valley, you guys, let's do 5G plus. You know, by 2025, you know, when it's like made in China, that year we will have 5G plus 6G. And let's mobilize our talent and resources in that direction. No, they don't do that. They're trying to pull China down. Right? So that's a big fundamental difference. But the confrontation is very much enmeshed, unlike the, the Cold War. So I don't see this as a Cold War. Now, in parallel, you can see in the Thai context, that confrontation has had an outcome. The US-China old order, new disorder, inconclusive. The jury is still out. We don't know who's going to win, who's going to have the upper hand, what kind of order will result out of it, or maybe indefinite disorder. But in Thailand, we've had a clear outcome. The established order has won. The established order is winning. The established order comprising against the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy. They, they, they've won. I mean, they pushed back the tax and juggernaut. We've had uh, four elections that counted, two that didn't count. All elections, the tax and juggernaut won, tax and party machine. We've had three coups in Thailand, 2006 military, 2008, December 2nd, 2008, judiciary, May 22nd, 2014, military. So three coups, and along the way you have three constitutions, four elections, and the final outcome that we have today is the established order is on top. Now, will they stay on top? Um, they have stayed on top by being pragmatic in a way. Uh, you know, China as a challenger being pragmatic, the US as an incumbent kind of being resentful and, and a, bit, a bit belligerent. But in Thailand, on the contrary, the established order has been uh, inventive, coming up with a constitution that ensures um, that it will stay on top with the Senate, um, with a political party, with different parties, but it's barely on top and it's wobbly, it's fragile. So the contest in Thailand between the established order and a kind of a new disorder or challenge a new political arrangement that we don't know how it will be shaped uh, is also inconclusive, even though the established order is on top. Um, and uh, I do hope that uh, somehow there will be a compromise. Compromise, just like the international system, a compromise means the US has to step back with it. They have to give more space to China, a lot more space. The Chinese can run the, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO. You know, they should have space to, to be in the leadership of international organizations and uh, the international apparatus, the international system has set up over the last 70 years. And the US maybe can acknowledge and join the AIB and make some, allow some space for China on Eurasia, the BRI, and so on. And the US can maybe Mm, softened, uh, nuanced the Indo-Pacific strategy a little bit, not as a direct counter strategy strategy to China's uh, uh, assertiveness. Um, so you know that kind of compromise would allow the international system to have modified rules and to to continue, really. Um, but in Thailand, uh, and we haven't seen that yet. And I don't think we'll see it. I think we'll see more tension and leading to, to, to confrontation. In Thailand, the compromise would look like this. Um, 
you know, elections have to count. You can't have an election and then uh, have the results be overturned in the streets uh, by a street protest leading to a military coup, and then a military coup, judicial decision. Um, but at the same time, political parties, um, winners from elections also have to be accountable. They have to um, avoid uh, corruption, graft. Uh, you know, we, the, the way forward for Thailand would be to, to strengthen these democratic institutions. And if they're allowed to be strengthened, that could be a kind of compromise gesture from the establishment from the established order. And if the established order is not interested in compromise, then you'll see manipulation, distortion, uh, anything, all means necessary to stay on top, uh, even though voices from below uh, are saying otherwise, the majority of voices from below. And if that's the case, then we also will see a lot of tension and confrontation in Thailand. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Tidinan, for an incredibly sweeping, uh, sweeping uh, view, which took us from uh, Thailand's uh, immediate post-war situation right through to today, in fact, and uh, raised a lot of interesting themes, which I hope we can return to, particularly this notion of the of the new Cold War 2.0 and uh, uh, the roles of um, not just the big powers, but particularly uh, this region and Thailand. But uh, that uh, brings us to our, um, our final speaker, who I think will address uh, the, the key issue uh, that we haven't really uh, focused on, the economy. And uh, uh, as we know, this is a particularly crucial year for Thailand as ASEAN chair, um, and also for the country's economy, uh, which is actually bearing up considering the political dysfunction, but We've seen some softening uh, lately and uh, concerns amongst our foreign investors, um, all those issues which I'm sure you're going to go into and perhaps shed some light on whether you think uh, you know, the country can generate the necessary momentum to get the economy uh, back on track and uh, break this cycle of um, stop-start reforms. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, so you asked a series of very difficult questions, but I think you can summarize it into um, how would Thailand 4.0 perform in Cold War 2.0, right? <laughs> um, first of all, Thailand is a small open economy. We enjoy economic growth by um, linking up with the global economy. The Thai economy has been, um, go has been going very fast in the past, uh, enjoying 7% uh, per year for four decades. But now it has slowed down um, after the global financial crisis and uh, this year projection would be around uh, 3.5 to 3.8 percent, um, which would be um, still roughly the same uh, for the next five years around. The OECD has projected the Thai uh, growth rate to be uh, 3.7 percent uh, for the next five years. Um, but after that, I think we are going to experience uh, a kind of slowdown because of our uh, economy has entering into uh, aging phase. Um, so uh, my researcher has calculated that we would have to minus that uh, maybe around 0.8% uh, um, per year. So uh, the economic growth of Thailand would slow down. Um, that um, the Cold War 2.0, the trade war between uh, US and China, uh, really warriors in Thailand because we have been benefiting from the global um, economic order. Um, looking at trade war, uh, um, first of all, uh, I, was, I, I, un I underestimated the impact of a trade war. I firstly thought as an economist, we think that a trade war doesn't make sense in terms of um, game theory. If China and US are self-interest, they are not going to enter into a long, uh, prolonged trade war because uh, it uh, kind of lose-lose game rather than uh, uh, win and lose game. So it, 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 it won't going to take long. But then I was, uh, I was uh, brought into um, a new reality that it doesn't seem to be a kind of economic uh, reasoning from both sides. Um, Titinan uh, quite uh, optimistic when he said about compromise, um, both in the uh, 
compromise in the global international order and compromise in the Thai political order. Uh, but in order for parties to get into compromise, they have to uh, move from uh, non-cooperative game into cooperative game, which requires trust, and trust is something really important here. Uh, when we look deeper at the trade war, we find uh, tech war, uh, the Huawei case and other uh, things happening at the moment seems to indicate that it's, it's not just like a, a simple trade war that uh, U.S. is um, experiencing a huge trade deficit uh, against China that makes it have to um, try to uh, rebalance the trade. Um, it seems to be something deeper than that. And looking deeper into the issue, I come to believe that it's not an economic game. It's a kind of um, political game. Uh, it's something similar to political scientists has called the two cities trap um, that uh, Graham Allison at, at Harvard has uh, studied uh, 500 years of um, recent histories and found that when there, there is a rising power uh, working, trying to overtake the incumbent um, during the 500 years, um, 12 out of 16 times there are wars. So this kind of thinking really worries me. So um, that's my, my understanding of the current trade war. It's not just uh, as simple as a trade war. It's a kind of um, two-city trap. And what would that mean to Thailand? I think um, from the economic perspective, we can have the following reasoning. Trade war would be both good and bad for Thailand as a small open economy. Why is it good? Because um, when a nation raise tariff against another trading nation, a big one, there would be so-called trade diversion, meaning that uh, certain kinds of goods that the U.S. used to buy from China will be diverted to other countries, Thailand included, even though we, we are a small player, but we still benefit from that. And every economic model that you run will tell you that uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and other exporting countries apart from China and the US, will benefit from that. So that's a little bit of a small food news in this, or this kind of global disorder. Another thing is that there will be a huge relocation of um, factories, business, from China to overseas. That has happened before during um, US and Japan uh, trade tension in um, uh, last uh, century, the, the, uh, the end of the last century. Um, and, and at that time, Thailand benefited quite a lot when uh, Japanese moved its uh, uh, production network uh, from, uh, from, from Nagoya, from uh, Tokyo to uh, Bangkok and Eastern Seaboard area. At that time, the Thai government has prepared the Eastern Seaboard project to receive um, investment at a time that the Japanese GN has appreciated a lot. And we had uh, built our industrial beds uh, during that, that time period. And at this time, there, we can still hope a little bit for uh, some relocation, and there are some early signs of that. For example, if you track the news, um, surveying uh, American companies in, in China, uh, MCham in China says that their member are thinking of moving out of China. And uh, not only American companies, but also Japanese, Taiwanese company. When we look at the news, uh, there are some companies already coming to Thailand. Panasonic has expanding its base in Thailand, Daikin, Delta, and many other companies. So Vietnam will be the country that benefits the most out of this uh, relocation. Thailand will be number two. Perhaps Malaysia would be number three. So by trade diversion and by um, business relocation, uh, we would gain a bit from this uh, really sad trade war. But now there's uh, bad news. The bad news is that if the Chinese economy has, uh, is, is going to slow down due to the trade war, uh, that would be bad news for Thailand. Uh, Thailand um, has um, deepened its economic link with China. We have increased the ties with China 10 times during the past 20 years. Um, to give you some examples, um, for the past 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, uh, Chinese tourism um, revenue, from the point of view of Thai uh, tourism revenue, is only was only five percent. 
now it has become 29 percent. Huge revenue from uh, Chinese tourists. Uh, foreign direct investment from China used to be uh, 0.3 percent 10 years ago. Now it has been uh, 14 percent. So if the Chinese economy slow down, that will have some uh, negative consequence to the, the Thai economy. And if, in the worst case, uh, China is uh, experiencing hard landing because it's really high um, debt to GDP ratio, it now stands around uh, 300%, um, three times debt. That is three times of GDP. And there are some calculations, some simulation that if there is trade war, 25% tariff, the uh, debt to GDP ratio will go much higher, probably 500%, 600%. And that will be really scary for not only Thailand, but for the whole world. Um, and um, uh, Danny has uh, raised a very really important point and asked whether ASEAN um, can um, take leadership and provide a new architecture uh, for the global order. Um, I, 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 and, and today, uh, and, and Gwen has mentioned that uh, this year, uh, Thailand will be the chair of ASEAN. And many people in, uh, uh, in Thailand are quite excited that we are going to be the chair of ASEAN. Um, I think there are two versions of ASEAN integration, the ASEAN economic community. Um, um, the, the former one, which are the ones that are uh, pretty much talked about by uh, political scientists and economists, are the so-called the de jure one, uh, the one that, that have uh, some agreements on top. We have ASEAN economic community, ASEAN security community, something like that. And there are a lot of uh, many sides agreements. But I think that one has not um, really materialized during the uh, past year. It has not um, achieved the goal set uh, to aim. Uh, but uh, there is an uh, undercurrent version of, of, of ASEAN, the de facto integration. Uh, I'll give you uh, only one example. That now, uh, if you look at the uh, Thai company listed in the Thai stock market, the uh, SET or the MAI, the MAI is the, um, the alternative market of, uh, for, for, um, for smaller uh, company. Uh, now there are roughly around 300 Thai companies listed in the stock market that have invested in ASEAN. And we have increased the shares of the um, Thai export and import um, with ASEAN members. So this is the real in ASEAN integration that has happened. Um, the official one has not kept up with this one. Um, so if uh, uh, thinking of, about this fact, um, I am quite, um, um, I'm not so sure that ASEAN can take up the leadership, can, can, can lift up the task of lead, um, having the leadership and um, designing or, or um, bring about, uh, bringing about um, the new uh, economic order. Uh, I think the, the real test would be a simple thing. Can ASEAN work together and bring the RCEP agreement, which has been long delayed, to be concluded by the end of this year. This is a simple test. If ASEAN cannot achieve this, I don't think uh, it. I think it would be too optimistic to think that ASEAN can um, can be a new force in the uh, global political order. Um, and if ASEAN cannot do that, um, what? How 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 can uh, Thailand and other small uh, ASEAN uh, country? Due to COVID, the trade war and the global economic disorder, I think then we have to find our own uh, solution, uh, find our insurance policy. Uh, for Thailand, we have to enter into a uh, big trade agreement, for example, the CPTPP with Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, many, uh, a few more ASEAN countries has already joined. And Thailand would probably be uh, wise to consider upgrading its existing uh, trade agreements with uh, other um, uh, trading partners, for example, Japan, China, and Korea. Uh, uh, it would be wise for Thailand to rebalance its uh, um, dependence on the global economy, not too much 
um, on one particular country, which is China at the moment, but uh, diversify its reliance in, uh, on, on many other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sonja, for that. Actually, I'd just like to, just continue on your um, theme, I'm glad you mentioned uh, RCEP and, uh, and the role of uh, this sort of uh, trade uh, cooperation and agreements, but um, do you think, I mean, I think there's a, a general feeling that uh, RCEP could be achieved next year, not this year, but do you think, given the urgency and the rapid escalation of the trade war much more rapidly than the region or anyone really thought, uh, that would still um, st still provide some breathing space if we're looking at an RCEP next year. And the other thing I think might be useful to look at is uh, how important uh, both together. I mean, is the ideal for Thailand to be in both uh, the TPP, the new style TPP, and RCEP, or is RCEP the most immediate important uh, 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 I think um, it would be wise for us to both consider um, the, the both alternatives, RCEP and CPTPP at the same time. There is no conflict between that. But the problem is RCEP is always one year in the future. It has been like that for five years, I think. And always it, next year, you mean? Yeah, always next year. And even though, even if we can conclude RCEP by the end of this year or probably next year, uh, another point to look at is the quality of the, the agreement. RCEP is, is a little bit shallow comparing with the CPTPP. Uh, so um, I, I think uh, as a small open economy, we have to see as many options as possible. Right. 